Hey guys, Pete here. It's time for the breakdown of Fargo Season 4, Episode 6. Camp Elegance sees things ramp up in the pending gang war in 1950s Kansas City. This was well expected considering the closing moments of the previous episode, and the fallout of that character's death is shaping the decisions that the Cannons and the Fadas find themselves having to make. Overall, that's a good thing. It also means that some of the most interesting characters from Season 4 are pushed to the side this week. Before I get into the recap, this is your spoiler warning. I'm going to break down everything that happened in episode 6, so if you haven't watched it yet, then this video will not be for you. Subscribe to my channel, go get yourself caught up, and then come back to discuss the big moments. Now, let's get into it. As I just mentioned, this episode revolves around the aftermath of Dr. Senator's murder. This means that there isn't a lot that involves U.S. Marshal Deffy, Angel of Death Orietta, or the possibly haunted Ethel Rita. Deffy's only scene isn't much more than a shot to remind us that he's still a part of the story. It's not not important. He's sitting in a car outside of Otis's place, and he does see Loy Cannon and his men on their way out. But since there's no follow-up, we don't know what he makes of it. In Ethelita's one scene, we see her return home for her birthday celebration. Her mom has done some repair work on the cake, which was worth a chuckle, and we watch as her parents try to keep their uneasiness under wraps. As she blows out the candles, we get the idea that the birthday girl may also be struggling with her own uneasy feelings. As over her shoulder, we get another glimpse of Mr. Snowman, which also serves as a reminder, and it's another part of the story that we won't be revisiting just yet. Orietta does have slightly more screen time, where we learn that Ethel Rita did in fact send the letter to her boss, Dr. Harvard. He receives it, so he calls her in, and while this certainly hits a nerve and worries her, she's able to use her charms to talk her way out of any consequences. It's notable that Dr. Harvard won't let her see the letter. She does her best to get a look at the handwriting at least though, and this will likely be all she needs to figure out who the author is. After all, since she let Ethel Rita into her apartment, she would already be on the short list of suspects. And as viewers, we know that she left her journal behind in the closet where Orietta keeps all of her trophies. That puts the two women on a collision course, which okay, but it feels sort of disconnected from the main story. Since they don't play a big part of the episode, I'll come back to this after the recap. In the main story, our dirty cop Otis finds himself in a difficult position. After returning home, he's attacked in a scene that manages to deliver nods to the original Fargo movie and No Country for Old Men in a single sequence. Omi jumps out from behind the shower curtain to choke him out, nearly killing him until Loy steps in. He cuts the curtain just as Omi releases the chokehold, allowing the man to breathe. This in itself is a statement, which makes Loy's follow-up monologue fall a little flat. It feels similar to Josto's monologue to Cannon's men in the jail. The idea behind it's fine, but the way it's all thrown together, it feels a bit unnecessary. Regardless, the point is made. Loy and his gang now own Otis, which is in direct opposition to his employment by the Fadas. Across town, Gaetano Fada is spending the afternoon listening to opera and stabbing a dressmaker's form slash mannequin with a large knife like you do. Out the window, we see Zelmer and Swanee arrive, and since they're dressed in lingerie, the Fada men welcome them inside. This turns out to be a costly mistake, and we hear violence erupt downstairs as Gaetano scrambles to defend himself from an attack. He unloads his gun through the closed door, killing his own guy, and things don't look as if they're going to improve for him as we watch Swanee slip through the window behind him. Zelmer makes her way up the stairs, which puts her right in his sights, so her partner has to shoot him from behind. Turns out Zelmer isn't happy that she shot him because they have orders from Loy to bring him in alive. Since she shot him in the head right above his ear, it seems like that would be out of the question, but then they realize he's still breathing. The next time we see him, he's chained to a wall with his arms tied behind his back while he sits in a chair. And he's very much alive. The shooting, the falling on the floor, the blood squirting out of his head, it all comes off as a fake out, which I'm not really ever a fan of. The one thing I can say though is that at least in this scenario, they don't let it linger. 
Lloyd plans to have Omi utilize some of his boxing skills to punish the Italian just after Lloyd drops another monologue, this time about Sugar Ray Robinson. The point of it all is to let Gaetano know that murdering Dr. Senator is the decision that got him killed. Later, there's a strangely placed flashback where Lloyd tells Dr. Senator he needs to get Satchel back. Doctor warns him that if he does that, it's going to spark World War III. Lloyd then claims to have a plan, and then we snap back into the current timeline. The reason it feels so strangely placed is because this happened before Doctor was killed, but then also before Lloyd made the move to pressure Otis into working for him. Either way, Lloyd has Otis brought in for a meeting. It's in the same place where they're holding Gaetano, so he sees him. He told them where he was, and he knows they found him. He tells the cop that the kid exchange is over, and he expects him to bring him Satchel. Lloyd plans on killing Gaetano and then taking over the town, but not before he gets his boy back. Otis does have access, but rightly tries to talk his way out of it because it's objectively a bad idea. Lloyd doesn't really care how or what he does, he just needs his son out of the Fada house. Otis recognizes this as a suicide kind of mission, but he has no choice other than to go along with it. Abel makes a cinematic entrance as he returns from his New York trip. He introduces Joe Bulow out of New York, who he's brought with him, adding another character from season two to make an appearance. Abel explains that New York will only have Josto's back if he fixes the problem with Loy Cannon within the next two weeks. He's about to explain the second part of the deal when Constant Calamita interrupts to inform Josto that Loy's men grabbed his brother. Josto asks if this means Gaetano's dead, but Constant doesn't actually know. Abel is shocked to learn about the killing of his counterpart, Dr. Senator, while he was gone. He's relieved to find out that Josto didn't order it, but realizes the implications and the tensions both in-house and with the cannons. Constant insists that they go after Gaetano, but Josto's more interested in learning what New York's second condition was. Abel explains, they said if you want to be boss, you gotta make things right with your brother. Otis arrives at the Fada house, intending to follow through with his orders from Loy, but he's intercepted by Constant. He tells him Josto needs him at the club immediately, so he abandons the idea of scooping up Satchel for the time being. Before they get there, Abel explains that the Fadas are going to have to make a trade of cash and territory to get Gaetano back. At this point, it becomes clear that Josto sees an opportunity and is putting together a plan of his own. When Otis and Constant arrive, he tells the detective that he needs him to get rid of Marshall Wickware immediately. He then gives him until 2.30 to locate his brother, since they're supposed to do the trade at 3 p.m. Josto then openly questions Constant's loyalty, which emphasizes the fact that he could use the man that's been helping his brother as a fall guy in whatever his plan is. Josto then tells his brother-in-law Antoon to go to the house, tell Rabbi to come meet him, and then take Satchel Cannon for a drive. Antoon is pretty well unknown to us at this point. Other than being the guy that fell asleep watching his father in the hospital, his entire arc begins and ends in this episode. He's pained as he understands his boss's orders to mean that he wants him to kill the child, but as a loyal soldier, there isn't much he can do beyond following them. Still, he tries to remind him that this will likely result in his brother and his son Zero being killed in retaliation. This is where it comes out that we may have been underestimating Josto's grasp on things. He doesn't seem worried about his brother because, well, he hates him for one thing, and he understands New York's position to be that he tries to resolve things with Gaetano. Emphasis on him trying rather than actually resolving. He also thinks he can deflect things and might even be able to talk Loy out of killing Zero by putting the blame on Calamita following the wrong brother. Antoon makes it to the house where he finds Rabbi talking to his wife. He tells Rabbi the boss needs to see him alone. He does as he's told, telling Satchel goodbye with no idea what's about to happen. Antoon has a moment with his family and tells the cannon boy to grab his coat because they're going for a ride. His wife puts together the pieces of what's happening and she starts to pray. He tells her not to wait up for him as he leaves. Rabbi meets Josto outside Joplin's. The boss instructs him to go see Abel, but Rabbi's concerned about Satchel. When asked, Josto just says the kid's gone, and then he drives off. That sends Rabbi back to the house, where he shoots one of the Fata men and demands information from Antoon's wife. 
he's taken Satchel to a remote location. He walks him through the woods and the ruins of an old building. Antoon explains it's where he was brought after he was captured in the war. He was almost dead cooking his belt when the Americans found and saved him. He recalls seeing fields of corn and remembers the smell of the bread, bringing him back to life in the land of plenty. He remembers the big American sun and how it made him grow big and strong. He tells the boy how he carved his name on a stone, Antun Dumini, American, and tells Satchel to climb down and get a look at the carving for himself. As he does, the man tries to follow through with his orders. We see his hand trembling as he holds the gun out, ready to fire, trying to fire. He tries to force himself to pull the trigger while hearing his own children's voices in his head. Ultimately, he can't go through with it and places his gun back in his jacket. But just as he does that, a single shot rips through his back, killing him. Rabbi had shown up just in time and tells the boy that the war is on and they're not safe. Satchel wants him to take him home, but it's not safe there either. The boy confesses he's scared and Rabbi responds, me too. In the car, he explains, I never got to choose. A child soldier. That's what they made me. But that's not going to happen to you. Understand? Satchel understands and Rabbi explains they're going to figure out a quiet place to ride out the war. If he wants to go home after that, he'll take him there. He wants him to be able to choose for himself. The episode ends back at the hospital with a brief check-in with Orietta. We hear her patient's groaning stop as she exits his room. When she hears that it stopped, we see a smile stretch across her face. It appears that the letter wasn't enough to stop her from taking another victim. So, it's a mixed bag of an episode. I think overall it flowed slightly better than the previous one. And the big set piece with Satchel was more engrossing than Dr. Senator's ending. I could do with less monologuing and definitely didn't need the fake out killing of Gaetano. Things are still feeling a little messy, but it was very nice to see the payoff with Rabbi making his move to save the hostage. I think that was definitely the heart of the episode. Even though Antoon was nearly a brand new addition into the mix, I think the whole thing still worked. The actor did a great job, and the backstory, coupled with the impossible situation he now finds himself in, made it matter when he died, especially after he couldn't go through with the killing. Rabbi doing what makes sense for what we know of him gives me hope for where things are going. I mentioned coming back to Ethelreda and Orietta and how they both feel outside the main story at this point. I guess it's natural in a situation where you have so many characters to follow, but that doesn't make it any more enjoyable. Ethelreda was introduced in a way that made her feel central to everything. Orietta came on strong to feel like a super interesting wild card. Now you have these two compelling characters, in many ways more compelling than the leaders of the two crime families, and it's hard to see how they'll fit into the big picture. Josto putting together a plan that is pretty devious and also might work adds some depth to the character. I'm just not sure how believable it is based on his nearly cartoonish introduction. This felt like we're moving in the right direction at least, and it's good to have Abel back in the picture, especially now that Dr. Senator's gone. Another thing that stood out here for me was that there were a lot of great shots in this episode. Where some of the episode structuring and over-reliance on monologues isn't exactly to my liking, this is still a great looking show with great characters and great cinematography. I particularly like the sequences at Gaetano's and Otis's places. Some of my favorite shots in those were Swanee and White appearing in the window and the bullet holes in the door which reminded me of Blood Simple. As far as other Coen Brothers references, I mentioned the shower curtain choking out scene and then Antoon taking Satchel to the woods definitely made me think of Miller's Crossing. It was also pretty cool to see Joe Bulow make an appearance and it does make you wonder how things are going to play out in Kansas City how this will all connect to the Joe Bulow we meet a couple decades later. He worked his way up in KC. Mike Milligan was one of his underlings. It's all pretty interesting. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm still in the same place I was last week. There's a lot of great stuff going on, but it still has that feeling that the whole isn't as great as the sum of its parts at this point. But we're moving. We're getting some payoff. And I still have hope that they'll bring it all together in a way that will be satisfying at the end. So let me know what you think. Leave a comment and tell me where you're at. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.